Hey, everybody. Welcome. I'm Matt Michelotis, the author of the young adult fantasy novel, The Crescent Stone. And I'm very pleased to say that today we have Lindsay Franklin with us. Hi, Lindsay. Hello. Good to be here. I'm so excited that you're here and thankful that you made the time. Uh, I was just realizing, I think I told my gang the other day that these are young adult fantasy, but I was thinking about it and I think are they just clean fantasy, actually, not young adult? They kind of um, walk a bit of a line with that. I, I always think of them as young adult. I think of myself as a young adult author. Um, <laughs> well, I thought you were say you think of yourself as a young adult. I was like, well, you are, no, no. You are that, young. That ship has sailed. <laughs> My husband just turned 40, like, this week. And oh, so no. we're like, the ship has sailed. We're, we're in it now. We're You're in officially middle-aged. Middle yeah. oh. <laughs> yes. So, and I'm two years behind him, but it's always like when he turns something, I feel like I'm that age too. Uh -huh. We've been married since we were kids, basically. So I'm uh -huh. like, yeah, I'm basically 40. It's fine. <laughs> but, um, yeah. So I do think of them as YA. When I first signed um, with my publisher, they didn't have a separate YA imprint. So they okay. didn't always classify them as YA. Um, but now they do have a separate YA imprint. And I have, my sh series has shifted over to okay. the imprint. So. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Uh, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. I was, I was racking my brain afterwards. I was like, wait a minute. These are, I mean, they're appropriate for young adults, but are they young adult? So, okay, good. I'm glad I wasn't yeah. completely confused there. Okay. We have some people showing up. So Kirk Quinlevin says, good afternoon. Hello, Kirk. And Caitlin is here. She Hi, says, Caitlin. hello. We'll get a few more trickling in for sure. If you're here and watching, feel free to, uh, let us know you're here. Leave a comment. Whether on whether you're on YouTube or Facebook, we can see you. So let us know. And uh, this is just a reminder, whenever we have somebody that we're interviewing, I always buy a copy of their book to send to one lucky winner. Uh, so if you are, uh, uh, if you're here, all you have to do is comment. Anytime you comment, uh, like, or share anything, that'll give you an entry. And I do like a random number generator thing to find it. Uh, the Scales family says, hello, Mr. Matt and Ms. Lindsay. We are excited to hear from you. Awesome. So uh, let's see. Here. Kirk loves my chin. I uh, I stopped <laughs> shaving certain portions <laughs> of my face. Uh, for, I don't know. I, I, I'm i showering still though, Kirk. Um, <laughs> Patrick says, <laughs> hey guys, excited to be here. Hey, Patrick. And then of course, Dr. Awesome herself, Beth is here. Hey, Beth. Um, okay, so Lindsay, can we start with, uh, tell us a little bit about your writing journey. How did you get involved in writing? We've had people say, from my earliest memory, before I even knew English, I was writing. And then we have people that are like, yeah, I just kind of stumbled into it at some point in my life. What was your, what was your story? So for me, I've always been a writer. I used to write short stories. I, the earliest I remember was maybe elementary school. I was writing okay. short stories. And then I wrote my first novel when I was 11. Wow. Um, First but, novel. Yes. my And I, I don't even know how many words it was. It probably doesn't really qualify as a right, novel, well, but know. it was longer form. Let's just Novella. Okay. A novella. <laughs> a novelette. <laughs> Um, so that, that was always a thing that I did, but it literally never occurred to me that this was a thing that people did for their careers. Like oh. I, I knew that in the back of my head. You're like, oh, it's just a fun thing I'm doing. It was a thing that I did. And I didn't realize until I was a little older that all kids didn't write stories, that that wasn't just a thing that you do the way, you know, like little kids, oh. all kids color. And so I thought that it was like that, that all kids wrote stories. So um, did not think of it as a career path until in my 20s, really. Now, that's interesting. Maybe do all kids tell stories? I was thinking back to my kids, and they definitely did. They wrote little stories and things. I feel they like did. I did when I was a kid. I mean, so. my, my oldest is, um, he's very, like, concrete has a very math based brain and so i and he's on the autism spectrum and so i think that he didn't necessarily tell stories he was really cool when he would read stories he could like recite exactly what happened in the plot back to me he would remember every little last detail of the story so that i homeschooled my kids for the first 11 years or so of um 
of our schooling journey. My oldest son is 19 now, but um, so he was not much of a storyteller. My other two were, they would tell stories. Um, now that my youngest is 12, it's not necessarily something that she thinks to do, you know, like I'm uh -huh. going to sit down and write something. Yeah, um, right. I think it starts to feel like schoolwork for kids at some point sure. to, to write, but yeah. So you started writing seriously, like, oh, this could be a thing that we do when you were in your 20s. Mm -hmm. And then how long before you got your first, uh, your first book deal? Wow. So I started my first series probably in, I started writing it in 2006, I think. Um, and then I didn't really enter into the publishing world until 2010. So I was still in my 20s um, when that happened, but it kind of took me a while to figure out, okay, what does actually completing a novel look like and what does commercial fiction look like and uh -huh. you know all of those business considerations that when you're just being creative you don't have to think about any of that <laughs> right you know <laughs> i miss those days sometimes but <laughs> oh my gosh when i was a young writer i used to have these very complicated names for my characters i don't know why i just <laughs> liked it like these complicated almost greek ish uh, -huh. uh long names like uh erisichthon or something <laughs> And I remember sending it to a science fiction magazine and the guy wrote back, he's like, your story's fine. Uh, you know, I probably wouldn't buy it either way, but no, no one's gonna know what's happening. Like, you can't follow these character names. And I was like, whatever, old man. And then I started thinking about it. I was like, yeah. that is hard. Okay. Um, the, uh, Neil and Eva wanna say that they think your cat is cute. Okay, wait, which side are we? There we go, I'm backward from what I can see. That's Willow. I have three cats. Willow. <laughs> Willow, that's my girl cat. <laughs> Willow just likes to be where you are, doesn't she? And she is my one who will just curl up and stay there all day. So <laughs> I don't have to worry about her asking to get out. My two boy cats are like, they're up and down and they're under the bed and they want to go oh. out the door. I mean, they're all over the place, but she will just plop down with me. I'm like, that's my girl. <laughs> our, our neighbor's cat is a kitten. Her name's Masia. And she all day long stands outside our house meowing and we let her in she comes she purrs she sits down put her out again just more meowing she just wants to be at our house all day there's new kittens at her house so i think that's part of it but she's escaping ooh, baby who boy it's rough uh, <laughs> so uh lindsay tell us about so the weaver trilogy the third book just came out the story hunter yes. so tell us the main idea of the trilogy overall like how, how do we start what's the story what are we what are we uh what's happening here so in the Weaver trilogy, um, art is magic. And so my main character is a storyteller. That's her gift. And she, as her vocation, is a story peddler. So as she starts to tell stories, strands of color and light and glitter and fabric and all kinds of things will pour out of her hands as she's telling the story. So as she, uh, she tells the story, those strands weave themselves together and then when she gets to the end of the story, they form into a solid object where they crystallize. And so she has this little crystal sculpture that she can then sell. And so she travels around doing that. That's how she makes her living. And she comes from a very humble background, super tiny town. Um, she doesn't have parents. And so her whole goal in life is to work her way to the capital city and become the royal storyteller to the king. And instead, what happens when she's on a story peddling tour is strands that she can't control start shooting out of her hands and uh, accuse the king of treason. And so, oops, <laughs> yeah. So, oh, no. Oh, so bad job. Of, uh, yes, bad job. So instead of uh, becoming the royal storyteller to the king, she is now on his most wanted list. Right, and that kind of starts the action for the whole trilogy, which is uh, we have this young person with not a lot of defenses, no money, no family, uh, with the entire royal empire chasing her, basically. Her. Yep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so did you, when you started this story, did you already know, okay, it's gonna take me three novels to get through this whole thing, or did you, uh, were you just kind of planning one story and then you thought, well, let's add the others? Like how much of it was planned that it was gonna be a full trilogy? 
So when I first started this book, so I entered the industry about 2010, I got agented very quickly. She started trying to sell my first series that I wrote and then another mm -hmm. YA contemporary standalone that I wrote. And we got pretty far with both of those, but you know, nobody was willing to, to take the leap with me. So the Weaver trilogy was actually the third series or the third you know thing that we were trying to sell. And so I intentionally wrote book one so that it could be a standalone. If a publisher uh -huh. was like, all we're looking for is just, you know, one book for the debut author that is right. totally unproven. Um, but I also kind of made the ending that we could take this into other places if we wanted. And so um, it was contracted in 2016. Um, so worked on it for a number of years and the publisher wanted a trilogy. So that's where we took the ending on that's book one. <laughs> I'm uh I'm writing the last book of my trilogy right now. Yay. Tomorrow I should write the end. So I'm having all these feelings yes. as I'm coming to the end. I'm like, oh no, this character who I love, and this might be our last time, and blah, blah, blah. Like, how did you feel when you came to the end of your trilogy? It was a lot of mixed feelings, I think. Um I do a fairly extensive pre-writing. I have to outline, otherwise I can't keep all of okay. my thoughts straight. I can't uh -huh. like, uh, I just can't. I'm too chaotic in my brain to like uh -huh. ever get anything to make sense on the page if I don't have an outline. So I think I, I go through a lot of that kind of emotion during my outlining process when I'm figuring mm. out what's mm. gonna happen as opposed to like discovery writers are tend to be figuring that out more on the page. Right. Um, so, well, I think while I was outlining, I had all of the feels and I definitely had a moment when I got to the end uh, <laughs> of writing Story Hunter. But um, there was also relief, too, because it was like, OK, it is finished. It's done. Yeah. And I hope that readers are going to be happy with it. And I you know, was able to pull the things together that I wanted to. So there was satisfaction and relief and a lot of things, but also sadness because it's done. <laughs> <laughs> right. Does it, uh, so this is probably two questions, but like, do, do you find yourself going like, oh no, now I want to do more stories with these characters, but the trilogy is done. Uh, and if so, like, what's your next project? <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, so I actually pulled my street team about this while I was in the middle of writing Hunter, I think, or I may have just finished writing my first draft or something like that. And I said, you know, would you guys be interested in seeing anything else in this world? Like after Hunter's done, are we done here? And should we just move on to other things? And they were very on board for like some novellas and some other yeah. um, other things, maybe some prequel stuff. Um, so you know, we'll see. I definitely have a lot of ideas. And in fact, they gave me a couple of really good ideas that oh, I had not nice. thought of. <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> yes. we want to see more of this character like yes. that. They were like, what about the backstory between these two characters who I bring in together in Raider, Story Raider, which is book two of the series. And it had not occurred to me. I'd certainly thought about their backstory and what their history was, because that's very important for the the trilogy mm. itself, but it never occurred to me to actually write that uh -huh. <laughs> and write what their teen years were like and stuff. So I'm like, that's a very good idea. So um, I may end up doing some short fiction set in this world, but my next um, project project is a totally separate series. Okay. Okay, oh. cool. Yeah. Um, couple comments here. The scales are letting you know they have two cats named Daisy Aww. and Oreo. Those are nice yeah. names. Those are very nice names. I love cats. I'm such a cat lady, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let's see. Dana says, so excited for you coming to the end of your trilogy, Matt. Congrats. That's huge. Bittersweet for sure. Heart. It really is. Um, I met Dana because of these books. We were at uh, BookCon. Oh, nice. and, uh, oh, that's awesome. We, we met there. And that little baby she has there was like literally a baby when I met her. Oh. <laughs> Wait, no. She was pregnant with that baby when I met her. It was the second year that I met the baby. Oh, wow. um, okay. And the Scales family want to know, do you have a favorite character uh, and a character that's most like you? And was there a character that was harder to write? Oh, that's Abby asking that. Yes, that's a great question. Um, 
I, because this was the third project that my agent was going to be trying to sell for me, um, I made a very intentional choice not to write a main character who was much like me in uh -huh. um, this particular series because I felt like I was writing the same main character over and over again. Um, and she looked a whole lot like me. <laughs> well, in your I mean, previous I, books, you're saying yeah, that your character previous. was, it was Lindsay on an adventure? Yes. And um, I know we do that a lot as writers, especially with the Normal. first series, you know, and so the series I got agented with was that real first effort. And so that character is very much like me. She has my personality and everything. So I thought mm. with this one, okay, we're going to go a different direction. And my daughter was, um, who's 12 now, she was five years old at the time. And um, my daughter is such a character. And I thought, I'm going to base Tanwin, my main character, on Kira, my daughter. <laughs> and so she's got this like extroverted, bright, sparkly kind of personality, which was so much fun to write. But it yeah. was very like different for me to try to shift over into her um, mentality because I'm normally a quiet person. You know, when I'm not giving an interview, I'm a quiet person and uh -huh. I'm very <laughs> reserved and introverted. <laughs> and, um, you know, my sense of humor will be a little like snarky or sharper or something. And I was like, I'm not going to write that girl. I'm going to write this like bubbly, happy kind of girl. Um, and it was so much fun. I, I loved writing her. Did so. you did you ever have to go to your daughter for advice? Like when this happens, what is going on in your head? <laughs> like, why? how do you... I, I think because she was so young when I first started and I was first figuring out Tan Wen's voice, I think uh -huh. I just listened to her more than uh -huh. asking her questions. Right. So there are a couple lines in there. Um, Tan Wen has all these funny sayings and these little colloquial uh you know, sayings that she says these kind of farm girl things. And uh -huh. um, some of those are based on things my daughter has actually said. <laughs> and Hilarious. so people comment on those a lot. <laughs> but, you know, I'd be braiding my daughter's hair when she's five or whatever. And she's like, don't worry, mom, I'll be still as a pickle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> so, um, so there's a line in the story mm. color, the first book that is pleased as a pickle. She uses that as like uh -huh. a... Um, and so I think I just listened to her more than asking her, um, asking her questions because she was too young for, to probably oh, give me great answers it's, at the time. It is amazing what small children produce out of their minds. Like, uh, there's a character in my books called the garden lady that came, my youngest daughter, she was two or three came in one day and said, uh, I was just talking to the garden lady in the backyard. I was like, the garden lady. <laughs> She goes, yeah, she's the woman who comes and she trades you things for bottle caps and uh, pieces of string. And I was like, what? She's it. like, yeah, she comes and speaks to me in the backyard. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so creeped out, man. Uh, so I was like, well, that going bro. in the book. Uh, <laughs> I remember the garden lady from Christmas. Oh, my so. <laughs> gosh, yeah. She's not creepy in my book, but... It has that magical quality, though, right? Yeah. This person who appears. And why does she want bottle caps? Who knows? Um, I love that so much. And I think that even, you know, if kids don't write or tell stories, they all have that kind of imagination that I just love. Love yeah. that so much. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've got a we've got a bunch of questions here. Everybody's very interested. What are what were some of your favorite books uh, growing up, Hannah? Hannah asks. That's a great question. I was a voracious reader um, growing up. And so I've read across all different genres. Um, I can remember going, uh, my family didn't have a lot of money when I was growing up. So a lot of library books for me, um, that was like my uh -huh. favorite thing was to go to the library and check out, you know, a stack like this, whatever my limit was, I think they limited yeah, yeah. me to like 10 <laughs> or something, but bring those home, go through them. Or sometimes I'd sit in the library and read. Oh, I loved that. So um, I can remember trying to find all of the Wizard of Oz books across uh, public libraries all over San Diego County um, <laughs> to oh, try gosh. to get, there's like the 13 or 14. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Lot. Yeah. So I loved those. Um, my favorite book growing up, and I haven't read it as an adult because I'm kind of afraid to. I'm like, what if I don't love it as an adult, as a professional <laughs> author now? But um, growing up, I loved a book called The Farthest Away Mountain. Oh. And I know no one's ever heard of this no, book. No, yeah, it's I don't so know this good. one. <laughs> what's, what's it about? Um, so there's a girl and she's on a quest and I can remember her going up this mountain and there's multicolored snow on the mountain. And there was something so visual about it that I just loved. And it's by the author, um, Lynn Reed Banks, who did oh, yeah. Indian in the Cupboard. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So I think that's how I found farthest. So it's probably Mountain. good. But yeah, it's it's got to be well written at least, and it's this very like skinny book, especially compared to Indian in the Cupboard. I remember being a little thicker, but yeah. I loved that story. <laughs> wow! All right, I'm gonna check that one out. I yeah, yeah I haven't heard of if it. You can find it. It's yeah, hard. really. <laughs> um, Dana says that her six year old was working on his comic book today and said chapter nine, finding a skull and discovering it's alive. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> uh, sounds pretty good. Kids have the most interesting that. brains. Write that. I would read that. Uh, I would read that too. <laughs> yeah. Tell your son, keep, keep going. Um, Caitlin wants to know, how do you get motivated to write? Oh, that's a good question. These are such great questions. You guys, my They're goodness. Smart. I love They're them. Smart. I know. Um, so this is an interesting question. I think when something, when an idea really takes hold of my imagination, that will motivate me to write um, kind of in an organic way. My deadlines motivate me to write. Ugh, that is my yeah. favorite motivation for writing right, right. there. If you <laughs> because, can get a deadline. Yes. <laughs> yes. And so sometimes I will actually set deadlines for myself um, so that I'm not, uh, you know, rushing up right at the end of my publisher's deadline. Um, and that's what I did in the days before I had a contract where, okay, if I want this, if I want to get this finished, I need to like have boundaries with myself um, and, and set a deadline and stick to it. Because, Lindsay, yeah. <laughs> you do what I do. I reward myself if I hit my deadlines. Yes. So I, I like buy a new book I really want. And it's like, yep. you can't read this till you hit your deadline like yep. that. Do you do Absolutely. that? Absolutely, oh. I do. Okay. And you know, cupcakes are my love language. Yeah. So I'm like, yes, where's uh, where's my cake <laughs> that I kept? Oh. So I get, uh, I'm like lactose intolerant, but I love milkshakes and ice cream. Uh -huh. And if I drink or eat them, I have like weird mood swings. I'll get really like depressed. <laughs> so the other day, my family, like my mom was like, hey, we're gonna buy you a milkshake today. And I was like, you can't do that. I'm writing right now. Like, <laughs> And I'm going to be too depressed to write. So no really milkshakes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's going to be a tragedy. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dr. Awesome wants to know, how do you go about writing characters who are very different from you? That's a great question, too. So I think... Um, Kind of as I was saying before, I think that listening is really important and that comes into play, especially when it comes to voice and kind of you can get insight into people's thought processes, of course, by, mm -hmm. you know, what they they verbalize. But I think, um, you know, I'm a casual student of pop psychology too and personality <laughs> theory and all of that. So um, I spend a, I spend a lot of time, you know, looking at Myers-Briggs typology uh -huh. and, you know, kind of dabbling with the Enneagram stuff. And so that helps a lot too, to kind of um, have that, that foundation or that framework, um, maybe it's a better word for understanding people who are different than you and who value different things. Um, you know, I like to observe people as well. So just I will observe, like, for example, the differences between me and my sister now that we are both mothers, you know, the things that mm. we that are important for us to instill in our children um, are, are different because our personalities are so different. And so um, like my sister's family is like very tight knit, like community, it's like a community kind of um, they're they're very close in that way. And in my family, it has always been important for me to instill um, independence and that sort of thing in yeah. my kids. And so it's, there's no right or wrong there. It's just differences in our personality and our kind of modes of operation. So I think um, being a really uh, careful observer of human beings helps in writing people who aren't like me, who have different personalities and different values. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think, you know, so I write in the messy, chaotic, like, let's see what we discover way. Like I'll have mm -hmm. like a I have scenes I'm writing toward, but I don't plot it all out ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And there's a variety of disadvantages to that. But one <laughs> of them is that there are times where I'm just typing along, well, what would this character do? And my first instinct is what they do. And that's not necessarily mm -hmm. what they would do. That's just what mm -hmm. I would do. Yeah. And then you have to realize that. So it's this constant thing of like, oh, no, no, they wouldn't get angry. They would be scared or, you know, whatever. Right, right. Uh, and that that's hard. That. Writing is hard, you guys. Did you know that? <laughs> um, Kirk says, is there an underlying message in your writing or maybe many? Yes, always. Um, 
Always. I think that there are a lot in this particular series. Um, something that I tend to write about a lot, well, First of all, I am the kind of author who works out my own issues in my stories. <laughs> <laughs> Is that everyone? Is that all authors? I don't know. Maybe. I mean, it's definitely me. I don't want to like make a universal statement that it's everybody, but I imagine it's a <laughs> lot of us because fiction is such a like safe place to do that, um, you know, to really analyze those events that happened in your past or to... Um, you know, to really dive into things kind of in that, like in a really deep heart space because it's the fictional world. So you can take those real things that happened or the real things you're struggling with and um, work them out in a fictional context where there aren't th that many consequences working out your issues in a, a, a fictional world. So yeah, exactly. That's yeah. right. Ooh, boy, that's, that's a really good word. Uh, <laughs> Hannah wants to know, did you did you have any stories that have been rejected, but you want to try again? You see if you can find a place for them now. Yeah, um, I think that the YA contemporary story that I wrote, I still love it. And my agent still loves that story. But I think it just doesn't have a home on like a shelf, like on a bookstore shelf. I don't know where that goes because it deals with teen addiction, teen drug addiction. Oh. And it's a very Christian story. <laughs> And so it's like maybe a little too dark for for what people usually think of as Christian publishing or Christian teen literature. And it definitely is mature themes. Like it's not a thing I would say, yes, hand this to your 12 year old. You know, it's more for older teens. Um, but but it's too for the secular market. It's a little too overt with, um, you know, presenting Christ as a solution to um, to certain things. So that's always a really weird kind of marketing line that authors right. of faith are having to, you know, um, navigate. So my fantasy is a space where I am a lot more subtle, probably with my um, with my my themes and my faith and that sort of thing. So um, those are easier for me to figure out where this belongs on a bookstore shelf. And so my very first fantasy series, I'm going to be repurposing some of those characters um, in my new project. So oh. the, yeah, so the story will get a total overhaul, but some of those characters that I just fell in love with, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago now, they're going to get uh, to be back on the page. Bring them back to life. That's yeah. great. I like putting some of my characters from previous stuff, just like little throwaway cameos every once in a while, if I can work them in. Uh, <laughs> like it that. just makes me happy. And it doesn't matter if no one else knows. I'm like, I know the whole story about that person. Yep, that's for you. <laughs> yeah, that's for me. I'm entertaining myself because I'm not allowed to have a milkshake. <laughs> <laughs> um, <Because> Ab <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Abby says, what is your writing habit? Do you set a word goal per day or a page number? Do you write in the morning, the afternoon, the evening? What do you do? I'm definitely a night owl, first of all. So uh, I can try to make myself write in the morning, but it usually it either doesn't happen or the words are just like, I frustrate myself because I'm just trying to make myself be creative and I don't really get creative until about 6 PM. So <laughs> uh, I don't know why, but that's just, you know, um, I go over to my mom's house. My mom lives not too far away. And so some weekends my husband's like, go hang out with your mom and just work with no like kids, no house responsibilities, whatever. So that's awesome. I'll go over to my mom's for the weekend. And my mom finally learned that, um, cause she gets really stressed if she's, sees me over there it's my special time away from my my regular life to write and I'm like lolling around in the morning as she's like you're wasting your time and she finally learned that it's I need that time in the morning to just yeah. do nothing and then I'll you're be getting ready night. you're preparing yes. yourself <laughs> mentally <laughs> and then I'll be you know writing from six to you know two in the morning or something right um, exactly but yeah I just can't make myself go in the morning um so I usually do word count goals Okay. Yeah. That's what, that's what I mostly do too. Um, that's why deadlines are so helpful because you know how many words to shoot for each day. <laughs> yep. And pages vary so much. So like in the industry, right. we're always using word count because, you know, something can be 200 pages, but the word count can vary significantly, um, you know, between two 200 page manuscripts or 400 page manuscripts is probably closer to <laughs> what we're writing. But well, and I, you and I may be the same in this, but if I set a time, like I have friends that they're like, 
this hour and a half a day is when I write. I'm like, that's amazing. How do you do that? Because what I do is I'm completely distracted and I don't produce the words during that hour and a half. So, okay. Yeah, I Um, I don't usually set a time, like a time window on it because I just, I don't do that usually, but. And I think, you know, for everyone, the, the point is you have to find the thing that works for you and uh, yep. where word goal counts might work for me and Lindsay. You might be like, oh, I wish I had an hour and a half of straight time. Maybe that's what you need. Uh, right. and, and that's OK. Like then work to get that. Uh, Dana says, I'd love to see Christian fiction open up to more raw, real stories. And I hope that that YA book sees the light of day, Lindsay. It sounds so good. I'll read it. Oh, thank you. I hope so, too. And what I may end up doing with that guy is indie publishing it. This is a great time to be an author when you have those stories that, you know, you just where does this even go on the bookstore shelf? Indie publishing is such a great option. So someday I may do that with that story because I still love that story. And I think it's a um, I think it is really important for Christian fiction to go there because that's our world. You guys, that's that's the world we live in. So. Well, and and like it or not, young adults are dealing with these issues, whether we write about them or not. Exactly. So, but, and like you said, uh, it's way better to look at consequences and deal with experimentation and things in the pages of a book than outside the pages of a book. Yep. Um, okay, so Lindsay, The Story Hunter, it's book three in the Weaver Trilogy. Uh, for those who are entering the competition here by competition, that's the wrong word, uh, The because <laughs> it makes it sound like I'm choosing. Yes, giveaway. Uh, the games, randomly yeah. chosen giveaway uh, <laughs> with your comments. I, if you have not read the previous books in the trilogy, of course, you can start with book one. If that's, I'm not going to send you book three if you haven't read book one or two. Uh, so you can tell me that uh, when you win if you win, whoever it is. Uh, And I'll wait till, you know, mid next week to pick the person uh, so that people who are watching this not live still have a chance to, uh, to get a shot at it. So Lindsay, tell us, uh, I have your website on here, which is lindsayafranklin.com. Are you in, are you anywhere else? Are you on social media? Like if people want to connect with you, where should they go? Yes, I am all over the internet. So <laughs> whatever uh, social media platform you use, if it's one of the big ones, I'm probably there. Um, my favorite is Instagram. Um, so you can find me over at Instagram. I love Instagram because it's just uh, pretty and it's positive. And so that's where I like uh-huh. to spend a lot of my time scrolling. Um, you know, <laughs> what about Friendster too, but... and uh, like MySpace? MySpace. Oh, man. <laughs> My kids are like, what? <laughs> MySpace. <laughs> Back in the day, yes. When I first started writing, I probably had a MySpace. That would have been the right time frame. <laughs> exactly. Okay, great. So be sure to uh, give Lindsay a follow on Instagram or if you're on Facebook, Twitter, wherever, wherever you can find her. There's multiple places she is. You have links to those on your website, as I yes. recall. Yeah. Website's a good hub for it. You can find any of my social media outlets from my website. Yeah. And then these books are really fun. You guys, uh, they're well worth your time. They're enjoyable, interesting. And I think the, the whole magic system of, uh, the arts that create, uh, like doing a story that creates actual artifacts is really fun and unique. Uh, and Lindsay does a really great job pulling out some of the, uh, pros and cons of that. (laughs) <laughs> uh, through the course of the trilogy. So, uh, Lindsay, thank you so much for being with us. Such a such a pleasure to catch up with you a little bit. Thank you for having me. This was super fun. Excellent questions from your, your listeners. I love it. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you uh, if you're around. I am reading through my book, The Crescent Stone, each day at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be up at it again on Monday. So thanks, everybody, and thanks, Lindsay. Uh, Have a great weekend. Bye.